for those of for those at home. And if anybody asks a question, you can. I know. I, I put down like, <laughs> if anyone needs questions. Okay. Are we live? Are we good? Yes, we're all good. Okay. What did we just say? We're live. <laughs> Before that. What cl what class live? is this? Oh, ACI nine. Seven. 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 But that's an easy. That's actually not incorrect because it in the reading in the binder it will be class material class six material for class seven. Confused yet? You know what? Geshla must have had a plan, and the class that he taught, uh, the class that he taught as class six, which I gave you last week, was like the heavy duty class. And for some reason, I still don't actually know what the magic of six is. But there, if you, f there you go. Well, if you follow the full ACI curriculum, you will discover that class six of every single course mm -hmm. is a really heavy duty class, either in um, scope or in length or both. So, yeah. So last week was really the first thorough unpacking of karmic correlations, causes and effects, right? Because you get introduced to all of that in ACI 5, which is the karma course. It teaches you about the laws of karma, the chains that make um, a cause much more significant and uh, the different types of results. Like ACI 5 really, really unpacks it. And then when we get to ACI 14, which is actually Lojong, it's all about um, the wild yogis actually and their amazing philosophy. In one of the chapters in that course, you get this beautiful story of uh, the, it's called the, um, we, the crown of, knives and it is uh, it's from scripture and it gives a really 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 intense teaching on karma and in that chapter of ACI 14 you're given all of the classic karmic correlations so lots of lots of karma so today we're gonna go back to today's class is really more about lists we're kind of the list lineage, if you haven't noticed already. Helia's smiling. Is that a happy smile or is that? <laughs> okay, today's class is going to be a lot of lists. So we were talking about, um, well, let's just do a quick review. The Vinaya, right? Because actually at the end of this class, you get, at the end of this reading, you get an explanation from Jason Kappa about what the title of his commentary means. And it refers back to the whole Vinaya canon, the whole scope of this whole course, which is about living a good life, ethics and morals being the uh, cause for happiness. So um, we're going back to the basics of Vinaya, and we're going to go over... Um, well, in a couple of the classes, we went through what the what the Vinaya vows were, what the different ones were for lay people and for ordained people. And remember, there was that one in between, where in between the a lay person and an ordination, you have to have that one little gap year or that. It, no, it was the um, leaving the home life. Remember? Yeah. So we talked about that. We also kind of overviewed the basic structure of the um, monk's vows and the nun's vows, right? And we went through the whole ordination path using the example of what the progress would be for a female, for a nun. And we talked about how there, ca there aren't any fully ordained Tibetan nuns in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage the, right now because there was a time in history when there was a mad king who murdered a lot of the nuns and broke the quorum. There, there's a certain quorum required to ordain a new fully ordained nun. And um, that's not to say there aren't fully ordained nuns. There are, but not in the Tibetan Buddhist lineage. In other Buddhist lineages, there are. So there are, they're trying to change that. But that's been a very long conversation that still hasn't been completely resolved. 
So today we're going to go um, back to the basics, but we're going to talk about Actually, the whole course is about who is qualified to take these vows, but we're going to get it in the form of who's not qualified. Okay? So say den. Ten. Yeah, it looks like ten, but it's kind of pronounced with a D. Den? Den. den yeah. And den means foundation. And these are the. Um, mm, see, if you have then you have the foundation for the vows to form if you don't have then you don't so we're going to be given a list now of the seven types of beings who don't have it if you ain't got it you can't get your vows okay so the first one is um they say that you have to be a human from the three continents. Now remember you did this mudra at the beginning of class, at the opening prayers? Um, this is a hand gesture that symbolizes the center of the universe, which in Buddhist cosmology they call it Mount Meru, and where your fingers are connecting, that's to depict the four continents. So three of these are then, and one of them isn't. And the one that's not, so in the scripture it says that you have to be human, a man or woman, from the three continents and are identified by their direction, north, south, east, west. So the one that isn't qualified is from the northern continent of unpleasant sounds. That's what's, what it's called. This sounds like a homework question, doesn't it? So the, the, the first of the foundational requirements. The first disqualified being is a human from the northern continent of unpleasant sounds. The reason is, and actually you'll find the reason for all of these disqualifications, what really is at the root of um, disqualifying a being from being able to take the vows is their ability or their lack of ability to get true renunciation. So they say that on the continent of unpleasant sounds, lifespans are fixed. It's fixed at 500 years. No more, no less, but it's fixed. 500 years is a long time. So you can go for a very, very, very long time with everything being absolutely okay. But it um, apparently because there is no guessing because there is no surprise they say that in that particular continent the beings just don't get renunciation there's just not enough motivation um, but the reason it's called the continent of unpleasant sounds is that when their time is up because it's fixed right it's finite um, they hear really really unpleasant sounds and then they know, and then it's too late, right? So, mm, see the minimum motivation to have true renunciation is to be aware of your mortality, to be aware of your death, to be aware that, you know, basic, basic death meditation, which is actually what we're going to cover in beautiful depth over the next three classes. Jason Kopp has gorgeous um, teaching in the Lam Rim. You're going to learn that death, well, this isn't news, death is certain, the uh, time of death is uncertain, and at the time of death you can't take anything with you, like not your belongings, not your family and friends, not your intelligence, not your looks, not anything, except for what you've put into your mind stream. So because um, we have that motivation in this realm, you're in the perfect place to have renunciation, but they don't have that in that first um, first of the ten. Okay, the second one, and remember they're describing the, it's kind of confusing because they're describing the den, but they're describing it as the people who don't have it or the beings that don't have it. Okay, so the first one was humans from the northern continent of um, 
unpleasant sounds. The second, then, that are disqualified from this, from taking vows, is um, a being that is who, someone who is impotent. And they say that um, in the Abhidharma, they describe that it's you require 22 different energies to be able to be a being who can take and have vows work for you. And two of those 22 energies is that you have to have male or female energy. And so if you don't, like they, they say that if you're impotent, you don't have um, sexual energy and it disqualifies you. It's in the scriptures as something that you need. There's something that they describe as the sexual energy of either male or female being related to a strength of will, to a willpower that they say doesn't exist if, um, if you're lacking in that energy. So the third then is um, if you are a neuter, and this makes basically means that you have wrong male or female energies, They've, the synapses are mixed up somehow, you know, the <coughs> signals are crossed. And uh, this particular category, they divide into five different kinds of female neuters and five different kinds of male neuters. I don't have the list here, but the um, they do define it as that. So, but I find it interesting that they define it as male or female because if you're a neuter, you're neither, actually, energetically speaking. So, mm, now, you can either be born that way or it can be the result of an accident. It just means you don't have the energy, you don't have the actual energy in your being to keep the vows. And the fourth, there's seven, right? The fourth one is someone who is a hermaphrodite, which means you have both sexual organs and um, at the same time. And again, they don't have the pure energy required to keep the vows. The fifth one is, um, in Tibetan the word is sok. It's someone who has um, It's someone who has committed the five mis one of the five immediate misdeeds. Do you guys remember what that is? Killing your mother, killing your father. That's the last one. So killing your mother, killing your father, killing your lama. Killing an arhat. Drawing blood from a Buddha with evil intent and causing a schism in the Sangha. Yeah. So, mm, I was also looking at some notes from another teaching Geshla gave of this, and um, he was saying that the specific details of this disqualification is someone who has committed the, um, the fourth one, the drawing but blood from a Buddha, which you actually can't do. They're talking, that vow specifically was relating to the historical Buddha. And um, that was several thousand, a couple thousand years ago. So you can't actually break it that way. Um, but that's what this one is, the fifth one. I would say that if you were a being, though, who did commit any of the other four, it would pretty much disqualify you. you. I heard killing your mother, yeah. killing your father, killing an arhat is an arhat is someone who has already reached nirvana, who has no more uh, mental disturbances at all. They're completely at peace. Uh, drawing blood from the historical Buddha, or causing a schism in the sangha means actually it could be as simple as splitting, dividing the people in this very room. Although again, historically, it would mean dividing up a group of monks or nuns and um, and they're all really badly motivated you know it's out of malicious intent or in with some sort of desire for personal gain or recognition or something like that like it's pretty pretty intense 
They do say that any of those five will take you immediately to the lowest of hells. And the Buddhist hells are not pretty. There is, um, was it the last course? It was the last course where we took a trip through hell, right? Yeah. The hot hells and the cold hells and all the different levels. And it's pretty intense. So, yeah. Uh, this, this one is the... Um, the, the worst of the worst of the screaming hot hells. It's like the one where you're just, they say the beings are just like a filament. You know, like in a light bulb, there's just that little thing. It, you're like that, and it's just outrageous no pain. Rest. No rest, yeah, no rest. The hell of no respite, right, or respite. No yeah, rest. exactly, that's what it's called. Yeah, don't wanna go there. So uh, the sixth one, because there's seven of these, is um, okay. This one, the Tibetan for this is Gulop Sunepa, and um, that translates as someone who takes ordination with the wrong intention, who um, isn't taking it out of true enunciation, is taking it because they think they're going to gain something that they can turn around and sell or, you know, profit from somehow or I'm just giving you examples, but really, really basically it means that they don't have true renunciation. They've taken ordination under false pretenses and that would be someone who would be disqualified from the vows. Even if they did the blah blah and it sounds like they got the vows, the vows wouldn't take. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work for them. Yeah. And then the last one this is actually a good Tibetan word, say Lokta. Lokta. Yeah, Lokta Chen actually is the person, but Lokta means destruction view. This is actually a, um, also the description of one of the main mental afflictions that we can have. And this is, they call it destruction view because this is the view that will destroy all of your virtue. And um, it basically means you don't believe in cause and effect. You don't believe in the laws of karma, and you don't believe in past and future lives. Now, even if you're not sure if there's past and future lives, as long as you're not completely dissing it, saying unequivocally does not exist and I can prove it, um, then you haven't broken it, right? But if you truly, truly believe that there are none, like truly, and that there's no such thing as cause and effect, that would be the destruction view, and that would also disqualify you from the vows having any effect, having any value, okay? So those are the qualifications, or rather the things that don't qualify. So if you're not any of those that we just talked about, you qualify, <laughs> okay? So then, if you actually get your vows, then we have to talk about, say, Tongwei? Tongwei. Gyu. Tongwei Gyu is how you can lose your vows, okay? And um, there's two ways. There's general ways and there's specific ways. So I wrote the transliteration on the wall. They are in your notes in the binder or online for free. And um, But we'll just go through these right now. So the first of the general ways that you can lose your vows, say Lapa. Pull. Lapa pull. Lapa means precepts and pull means to offer. So this is where someone would give their vows back formally. Um, Can they take them back if they want to? The thing is, Gashla says, you know, it's so significant to take your vows that, um, and if you've taken them for the right reason, and you know what they can do for you, why would you ever give yeah. them back? So it's a big deal. Like it has to be probably pretty ex pretty strong extenuating circumstances. But you know what? Throughout history, there have been people who have given their vows back. There are some really significant teachers alive today who gave their vows back, but are still really incredible teachers. So you can't judge. Case in point, Dr. Thurman. He was a monk. But he gave his vows back to get married and have a family. And he is one of the most incredible teachers I know of. He was the head of the Jetsun Kappa seat. 
you know, like there's, and there's many, many um, scholars in our immediate lineage who have formally given their vows back or appeared to. But you know what? I'm not enlightened. I'm not omniscient. I can't read their minds, so I can't tell you what the real reason was. Um, so we can't judge them. But if you know the value of what a vow can do for you, you don't want to do this if you can help it. But again, you know, there it's there as one of the ways you can lose your vows because if you give them back, you don't have them anymore. So, um, Gashla actually does say it's impossible to give them back if you truly understand them, if you truly understand what they can do for you. But he equally says, don't judge anyone who has. And as I said, there are real amazing people living today who have, so... We have a we have an example of both, right? Okay. Mm. Say she, who, she poo. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so she in Tibetan is actually the same in Chinese and in Japanese. It means four. It can also mean death. Mm -hmm. And in this um, in this context, it actually means to die. So, um, shipu is an idiom for dying and moving on. So, if you die and move on, you lose your pratimoksha vows. You lose your vinaya vows. <laughs> Geshla says, what about your one-day vow? It's a trick no, question. The one-day vow only lasts for one day. <laughs> which vows was the one we don't lose? Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva vows and tantric vows, actually. Oh. Yeah. So, um, next one, say Tsen Ni Jung. So, Tsen is, uh, can mean name or mark. Ni means two. And Jung means if they appear. We actually have sort of talked about this before. Maybe some of you weren't here for that conversation. But the mark in this case is talking about a sexual organ. And this is the this is the vow where it says that if you um, took the vow and you were one gender, and then you woke up and you were the other gender, right? Um, you would lose your vows. Although then there's the other one where a monk could change sex twice but not three times, right? That's, it's in the books. Like, so I know every time this has come up, and I remember when I first heard it, I thought, oh, they must be talking metaphorically. But it's in the ancient scriptures, so all we can assume is that it must have happened a lot back then, a couple thousand years ago. So, because it's all over the, docu the scriptures. But that's what this means, okay? Um... The next one, say Len Sum Gyur. Oh, this is the one that I just I gave I gave away the punchline. Sum means three. Len means uh, times, like you know, one time, two time, three times. So this is three times. Gyu means change. So if you change sex once, it's okay. If you change sex twice, it's okay. If you change three strikes and you're out, right? So not okay after three times. Okay, next one. Ge, say Geitsa. Che. Geitsa Che. Ge means virtue. Tsa means root. So this is the root of your virtue. And Che means to cut. So, mm, if you cut the root of your, your virtue, that might be Leonardo, um, you would lose your vows. Okay? So those are the general ways you can lose your vows. And then we have... Sorry, what does it mean to cut the root of your virtue? Uh, to, to cut the root... You know, he, he doesn't actually describe it, but we've learned in other classes that it would be to do any of those immediate five, five misdeeds. <laughs> and... Um, Basically, if you break, if you have bodhisattva vows, it would be 9 or 18. Like, there's several ways you can slice and dice it. Yeah. Hello. Are you here for the Vinaya class on ethics? Well, come on in and sit down. It's a Buddhist philosophy class. 
And we're halfway, actually we're three quarters of the way through a course on um, basically the monastic vows. And this isn't a monastic class, don't worry. You're not going to become a nun just because you sat through this one class. <laughs> Although Geshla does say he's really upset that people aren't like racing up to him to become ordained after this class. So we're learning about the different vows and the different um, things like that. Um, have you ever been to a yoga class here? Okay. No, not here. Okay. Oh, is this your very first time into Three Jewels, Vancouver? Yeah, I came up to get like a pamphlet. <laughs> okay. Well, you're welcome to you're welcome to pick up a pamphlet. You're welcome to stay for however long you like. But you're also welcome to ask me questions after. Okay. So um, those were the five general ways that you can lose your vows. Now here are the um, three specific causes. Okay. So say, this is a long one, say Nishu, Nishu. Malun, Malun. Derche. Derche. And this one, <coughs> I apologized many, many times that I suck in Tibetan, right? So that was really bad um, pronunciation. But if you get a chance, listen to the audio that's free online for the class, and you'll hear Geshla say it in exquisite pronunciation. It's really nice to get the blessing of the original Tibetan words. So Nishu means 20 years old, Malum means don't reach, and Darshe means find out. So this is actually referring to a monk. A monk has, um, a, a young man has to be 20 years old to be able to become ordained. So prior to that, because you know in, in Asia, in India, in Tibet, um, families often put boys into monasteries at like the age of three or like when they're very little. And um, so they're just baby monks, right? They're not actually ordained until they reach 20. So this vow is if you uh, thought you were 20 when you took your vows and then you found out after that you weren't, then you would lose your vows. Geshla says it's a bit of a technicality because if you thought you were and you didn't find out, you wouldn't lose your vows. But that's what this vow says, okay? Or that's what this um, specific cause says. The second cause, say, did I get it right? Say Tenchul, Tenchul. Kelang. Okay, yeah. so Kelang means to um, take it, take it with, take it up with your. Oh, okay, that's literal. It it means to agree to do something. And what does Lang mean? Kelang means to agree to do something. Tenchir Kelang. Okay. This is actually in reference to an, uh, a nun. And basically it has to do with not um, adhering to the, the vows of celibacy. Okay. Agreeing to have sex, basically, is what it would, it would mean. And because if you are a nun, you're not supposed to do that. So you would lose your vows. And then the um, near shock day. Say near shock day. Near shock day. This is the third specific pause cause. Near nin shock. Sorry, means twenty four hour period, and day means passes. So this actually refers to the one day vow. So if you took a one day pratimoksha vow, then you would lose it after twenty four hours had passed, and um, that's all that says. Okay, but then the there's two more um, causes that two schools of Hinayana Buddhism say. Uh, Hinayana, remember, is they call them sometimes lesser vehicle or lower school. War Mahayana, which is considered greater vehicle, higher higher school. It's not whether one is better or one is worse. It's just different motivations, different um, uh, texts that they study, and different ways of getting to. The information, different motivation is the biggest thing, but these two schools. So the there's actually two names for each of the schools. So it sounds like four schools, but it's not. It's two. So the first school is the sutrists or the sautantrikas. Same thing. Okay, this school feels that um, uh, just make sure I don't mix, mix this up. Okay, 
sorry, the Sao Tantricas and the Sutras, that's one school. And the Vaibhashka or the Detailist, you guys might remember hearing that, the Vaibhashka. You know what, it gets complicated because they're talking specifically about a particular sect of the Vaibhashkas here. And they were called the, mm, something to do with the sun. What were they called? Under the sun is the name of this particular Vaibhashka Detail School. Um, so the Sao Tantrikas, or the Sutrists, and the Detailists, who were specifically called Under the Sun, um, believe that if the Buddha Dharma disappeared from the world, so would your vows. Like if the teachings disappeared in the world, so would your vows. Geshla says you could debate this because as long, like if you were someone with vows, Buddha Dharma would not disappear from the world, right? But that's just a technicality that these two schools say. By the way, if you're um, interested, the particular Vinaya that the lineage of the Dalai Lama, the Jaitsan Kappa school follows, um, is Kashmiri detailist. That's just a little Buddha t Buddhist tidbit for you, okay? Because we were just told that the under the sun detailists believe that this is another way you can lose your vows, right? The Kashmiri detailists don't believe that um, you would lose your vows entirely, but they do say that if um, if for some reason you did something to break a root vow, by the way, Joyce, that's the way you cut the root of virtue, is if you break a root vow of any of the vows you have. The um, Kashmiri detailists, the school of Jaitsankapa, the school of the, the lineage of the Dalai Lama, would say that if you broke any of your root vows, you would really irreparably damage your vows, but you wouldn't lose them completely. So they would say, and this is this phrase that you can't see, but say Bulun, Nornden, Shin. That's a Tibetan metaphor for a wealthy person with a big debt. So they say that if you're a person who has monastic vows or Vinaya vows, whether they're lay person or monastic, and you broke a, one of your root vows, you would be like a wealthy person who just accrued a really big debt. So it's not that you're not wealthy, like you still have your other vows, right? But by breaking this root vow, it's like all of a sudden just screwing up your credit rating in a way. It's kind of a Tibetan joke, I think. <laughs> so, you know, again, these vows, right? Like why? Why take them? Why are we spending so much time unpacking them? Why are we trying to uh, decipher these ancient sources for them? And remember from class one, Geshla said it's because it's the causes for your own happiness. It's not because they're restrictive or that they're somehow, um, you know, you have to give stuff up and you do have to give stuff up, but you have to give stuff up that harms you. You have to give stuff, you, what you have to give up is the, is your attachment to suffering, is the way you view the world the wrong way, right? So the promise that the vows hold is twofold. One is that if you take, if you, first of all, if you find a teacher and you learn how to do this stuff and you take your vows and you keep them, then the first thing is that you will um, protect yourself from ever falling to a lower rebirth. That's a good thing, because if you did take last course eight, that little walk through hell wasn't fun, right? The second thing is that you actually are you have the fuel to reach enlightenment. And they say that if you have the proper training and the proper initiations, proper motivation, and you do, like you follow all of the steps that you can do it in one lifetime. That's what they mean by in a single instant. But at the very least, they talk about something called the three enlightenments. And at this point, Gashala gives us a brief review of the five different paths to enlightenment. Do you guys remember, like there's the 
stage of accumulation, right? <laughs> Where we're trying to really get clear on our motivation. We're fed up with being unhappy. We're fed up with problems happening over and over again. What are we going to do about it? That's the renunciation phase. And then you get on to the um, path of preparation, right? Where you're really cleaning up your karma. You're really accruing the virtue that can propel you forward and upwards. Then if we practice and meditate and do our yoga and do our studies and stuff, we will work internally and externally to get us to a point where we can perceive emptiness directly and have that um, transformative experience of really understanding ultimate reality, right? They call it the path of seeing. At the path of seeing, you do, once you come out of it, you lose two of your kleshas, your nyomongs, your mental afflictions for good, for good. Right? You lose forever, you lose doubt. Do you guys remember the other one? You no longer believe that things are self-existent, that they appear the way they are. You have no doubt. They may still appear to be external, like coming at you, but you never again doubt that, right? So, um, and then you spend time on the fourth path of habituation doing mop up and clean up just like cleaning up your old deep dark pockets of bad karma and amassing good because you can't you can't doubt anymore and you can't um you don't see things the wrong way you know you can reach that point and still have all hell break loose you can reach that point and still be embroiled in controversy and have people dislike you and all this stuff but in your mind you will not misunderstand any of it. And then if you continue along, you will reach a point where you actually become an arhat, which is mean, means that you reach nirvana. Nirvana is not a geographical place. You know, sometimes we hear stories and we think nirvana is basically a Buddhist heaven. Like you go there when you die and you get wings and you sit on a cloud, right? That's not it. Nirvana could be very well, I mean, you guys are just here to humor me anyways. So for all I know, you're all in nirvana and you're just helping me get there by teaching. But if you were in nirvana, you would still be in this room. It would just look completely different to you because, you know, it wouldn't be too hot or too cold or your legs wouldn't hurt or you wouldn't be tired. Like you just wouldn't because you would have nothing that would disturb the peace of your own mind. Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, a really good exercise is to just think, what would I feel like right now? What would I behave like if I, if nothing disturbed me? It's a really good contemplation to do. I just pretend that you're already perfect. You know, it's really, really cool. So at that point, at the point of the direct perception of emptiness and at the point of when you finally get rid of all your other 83,998 afflictions, right? Because it was, we had 84,000, yeah, something like that. It's either 76,000 or 84,000 or something crazy. But once you get rid of all of that, um, no matter what appears to be going on around you, you would never, ever, ever be anything but content, anything but blissed out. You know, then arises the question, well then, could an arhat um, know that I'm suffering? Like, if they're, if they're incapable of suffering, how could they have any sense of compassion or affinity for anyone who is? And what they say is that they actually can see you suffering. They can see that you're suffering. And they can understand the causes of your suffering. And they can see very, very clearly that you're going to be okay. Maybe not in this moment but um, maybe not in this lifetime, but you know, they understand all of that. They also feel a real, they feel compassion, but they feel, and they feel sad for you, but they feel it in a really sweet way. So it's not a disruptive, uh, it's not a disturbance. It's completely different. And um, it's almost like when the kids burn themselves in the hot water, that it's not too hot, but just kind of know, okay, 
but at that moment for them it looks very dramatic but you just know they're just going to be okay. That's probably very very similar except that it could be that dramatic and you would still think that you understand they're in pain and your heart goes out to them but you're not um, because most of the time we feel our own pain because we're actually still conflicted somehow. You know, we still have something going on, right? And so if you didn't have that thing going on, if you didn't have the capability to even feel irritated or frustrated or, or, or um, if the ego didn't pop up, you know, like there's all these, well, there's 84,000 of them, right? <laughs> so they say that both the direct perception of emptiness like once you've passed that point and once you've gotten past nirvana um but you're not fully enlightened you're not on step five which is the path of no more learning right which is enlightenment that those are still considered like baby enlightenments so the three all those three stages are considered the three enlightenments we don't talk about it much in our lineage but you might hear of the three enlightenments in readings or other literature so just to tell you that's what they're referring to they're referring to um, arias arias are people who have seen emptiness directly arhats are arias who have completely done away with their mental afflictions right and then buddhas so they're they're talking about all of that when they talk about the three enlightenments and that's the promise of the Vinaya that's the promise of an ethical way of living not because it's gonna make you a nice person actually it's gonna make you a nice person but that's just a byproduct the real reason is because you're gonna be happy forever and you're gonna know how to make other people happy well you can't make other people happy, but you can certainly show them and teach them right that's all a Buddha can really do anyways is to teach Okay, so um, Choni Lama Drakpa Shedrup. Remember Choni Lama? We've talked about him a few times. He wrote most of the um, textbooks of the Sarah May Monastery, where our root teacher Geshe Michael got his um, Geshe degree. Um, he talks about the ritual of um, Sojong. It's the monastic practice of confessing and uh, how valuable that is. And I know I've pitched this before, but we are going to do a Sojong practice here for lay people on the 23rd of June, which is a couple Sundays away. It should be done on the new moon and the full moon, so we're going to do it on the full moon. And what Choni Lama says is that um, if you are even in any, if, if you're even wondering, if you've gotten close to breaking a vow or if you're experiencing any sort of unhappy happiness at all it's the result of having put some unfortunate causes into place before right anything like that that the um, art of confession is really 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 powerful and really useful and so that um, he highly recommends it and you know you he says if you break a vow you must repair it immediately because karma like it grows right I think the math was like it doubles every day so it's pretty scary we did the math one day and it was like if you just take like squishing a bug for example and you multiply it like by it it is it actually explains why you might actually get a diagnosis of cancer when you're 40 you know if you squished a bug when you were two like it's frightening seriously and um, but again, it's not as, I shouldn't say that that's not the cause for cancer, okay? But it is. If you suffer any illness, the cause of that was harming or not looking after someone or something. Hello, Leonardo. Um, at a certain point, and karma grows, right? So um, Choni Lama says that your best sort of protection against that is this Sojong practice. And if you can't do Sojong, do the four forces. On the 23rd, we are going to do both so that you will have all of your armor, all of your toolkit for purifying any um, bad stuff, right? Do you guys remember the story of Lord Atisha? Lord Atisha is one of the great sages in our lineage. He was a big teacher in his day, and he traveled with a huge entourage. And a three-day trip, because this was all, this was many, many hundreds of years ago, right? This is um, when they all traveled by horse or yak, <laughs> it was Tibet. No, it was India, actually, he was in India. And uh, 
He traveled with a stupa, which is like a, a religious um, relic, thank you. And um, he would insist on stopping the entourage, jumping off his horse, circumambulating the stupa, and purifying, like confessing whatever popped up for him. So a three-day trip would take 20 days because he was just constantly cleaning up his mind, right? It's pretty amazing. Okay. Um, let's see. So that's basically the sales pitch for knowing, taking, and keeping your, your um, prati moksha vows, your individual freedom vows, as they call them, right? Because it's your ticket out of the lower births, and it's your ticket towards nirvana and full enlightenment. And um, here's the added bonus, the value added, okay? If you have any sort of a meditation practice, if you have any sort of a spiritual study, and you're not seeing any results, you're having a hard time. You know, like the meditations aren't working, the yoga isn't having an effect, the angels aren't coming and talking to you in your dreams, you know, it's just nothing's going on, then Geshe says take a look at your just your basic fundamental ethics. If you have vows, how are you keeping them? If you don't have vows, what are you going to do about it, you know? And, um, you know, in our school, in our lineage, our own sort of built-in safeguard is the six-time book because it's a way you can check your mind six times a day for what did I do good here? What did I do not so good? What am I going to do about it, right? So it's a really good way to just um, have a check-in so that that karma isn't growing so fast and that the good karma is because you want to perpetuate you want to perpetuate the good stuff you want to um, make sure that happens Leonardo you missed the little bit although you can listen to it where I was talking about the uh, quick review on the five stages the five paths to enlightenment because Geshla actually chooses to give us a little refresher in his sort of pitch for the Vinaya and the promise that it holds and he did talk about how when you're in these three enlightenments either the you're you're already an Arya because you've seen emptiness directly or you're an Arhat because you've done away with all of your mental afflictions you still could exist in a world that is exploding around you and chaotic and you could be embroiled in drama and trauma from the appearances of things but you would remain undisturbed you would remain just openly compassionate and um, aware that it was just the old seeds ripening. And how amazing would it be to be able to do that, right? So that's what we were talking about when you walked in. Um, yes, absolutely. explain like I've only started with my meditation practice so what does it look like to someone who's not getting anything out of their yoga say or their meditation you're just continuing to live an unhappy path is that what you mean that's pretty much your basic but you know there are very um, tragic stories about someone who has been practicing for 20 years who hasn't just started who has maybe received some pretty high, what they call initiations, and some pretty high um, esoteric teachings. And at that level, you know, the promise is that you keep your, you keep your practice, you, you do your meditations, and you should be happier. Like, that's, that's the ultimate promise, right? But not only that, um, pretty amazing things start to happen. Um, and if they're not happening, then a lot of people think that, well, there's something flawed about the practice or there's something wrong with the yoga. It's not about that. It's about the fact that we haven't actually really cleaned up our own minds, right? So, and actually you are starting to meditate, so you probably know, um, you can experience, you know, some days it'll be great and other days maybe not so great or more distracting you know they say the two immediate uh, problems we have are either dullness or agitation we're either too tired 
like we stayed up too late the night before or we ate too much or whatever and we just you know you're on your cushion and you're like <laughs> right and uh, the or you know you get a little bit better and you're actually on your cushion and you're okay and you think you have it but you're kind of fuzzy and it's kind of like this haze that's actually dangerous because that can be mistaken for meditation because you're relaxed like you're, you're feeling relaxed but it will have a heaviness to it and um, my problem is the other one where my mind is like breakfast you know <laughs> or like what with all the meetings I have to do it later after after, after I get okay I can only actually sit here for 15 minutes because I've got to get up and do this you know it's yes yeah, the agitated so uh, either or these are things that you learn with practice with meditation so good for you for sitting and you know it's good to do it a little bit every day and uh, as long as you keep that up you're you're gonna know now if you kept that up for a long time and you weren't seeing any improvement now improvement can come in for example for me I used to have a really hard time sitting and it's been like an hour and 15 minutes and I actually haven't shifted. If you see some of the tapes of my earlier classes, I was shifting every five minutes because my hips were killing me or my knees were killing me or whatever. But um, I did notice, now here's my pitch for retreat. I do retreats and I do one month retreats. And I noticed distinctly in not the one I just did, but the previous, no, three retreats ago, that I all of a sudden could sit longer than half an hour. And that was like a Yahoo moment because if your body is, you know, forcing you to move, no matter how much you want your mind to relax, you need to deal with the body, right? Like you have to. So that will improve. Like all of that improves with practice. Um, but if at the same time, your, um, you know, breaking all of those basics, right? Like you're lying, you're stealing, you're fooling around with somebody else's committed partner, you're um, doing all the downfalls of speech, like you're gossiping, you're, um, uh, what is it, harsh, you're harsh, you're uh, divisive. divisive, thank you, you're coveting, you're, you know, you're, you're happy when things go bad for others. You know, if you're doing all of those things, then even if you're uh, so disciplined that every day you're sitting for an hour, you're not going to get anywhere. It's just not going to happen. You know, it's that analogy, right, of the moon reflected in a still pond. If the, if the water is turbulent and it's pulling up all the muck, like if it's all dirty, you're not going to see the moon. Right? So it needs to be calm and still. And um, that's that's what they're saying. But yeah, you know what? That was a very, very long-winded answer to say, yes, you're right. It's the, um, the gauge is whether you're happy or not. And um, that's what I'm after. Sustained bliss. That's my new, my new, it's not my new goal. It's always been the goal. But that's my new, uh, what do you call it? Catchphrase, yes. Mantra. Yeah, yeah. John, who t teaches with me, who's not here today, but I think we're co-teaching the next class, next course, because he's teaching Wednesday nights. Definitely come to his meditation class on Wednesday nights if you can. It's amazing practice to get to stillness. Um, his new catchphrase is, um, be chilled and thrilled. Yeah. Because you have to be chill. You have to chillax, right? You have to be chilled. But you also want to be thrilled at the same time. And I think if you are doing that, then you are attaining sustainable bliss. So that's what that's all about. Okay. You know what? I'm just going to power through because we're almost done. And I think we can be finished before 9 and have some tea and cookies because I brought in a <laughs> fresh batch of Auntie's cookies today. <laughs> Not if you have anything to do about it, right, Okan? Yeah. Okay, so um, so no dance break today. We're just going to go right through to cookies, okay? <laughs> we usually take a dance we usually take a dance break if the class goes long, okay? So, um, 
oh, the one thing I will say about vows, because some of you in this room do have vows, and some of you are just starting, you, whatever level you're at, you got to do it to your capacity. Okay, those of you who have bodhisattva vows, do you remember Master Shanti Deva said that don't start off by giving away your arm because you're going to regret it, mm. right? So he says, carrots and potatoes. Give carrots and potatoes and keep giving carrots and potatoes or the like until you have really worked up the strength. you got to work to your capacity. Actually, Donovan, this is very similar to a question you asked me last class about the gym, right? About whether you should have stayed or done something or not. Well, actually, Master Shantideva answers you in this class. And he actually gives the specific... I'm actually just going to read this because it's so beautiful. Mm. They say that if an action is in your capacity, if you're strong enough to stay in a difficult situation and learn from it without it affecting you, um, adversely then stay and the analogy for a bodhisattva is like is the the lotus actually the lotus is very significant in a lot of Buddhist imagery a lot of spiritual energy because a beautiful lotus rises from the muck have you ever seen a lotus in a pond like the the water that it happens to be in is really muddy and murky actually but it rises out of that muck and mire and into this beautiful flower right so, um, Master Shanti Deva says that um, when you're ready, like once you have the capacity, um, you can deal with the filthiest of crap. And actually, it's in the most difficult situations that a bodhisattva can really show their stuff. They can really shine because they can, they, you can teach through your actions, right? You don't have to say anything. You just have to be holding the line and uh, people will know. Mm. There is this bodhisattva story about a high, high level, and we're talking high level bodhisattva, okay? who was able to remove their eye and give it to someone because they needed it. And they felt no pain. They were able to do that. They were well beyond the carrots and potatoes. But Master Shanti Deva says, don't do that if you're not ready because it's going to hurt and you're going to regret it, <laughs> okay? So don't, don't do anything. And by regretting it, you, you diminish the virtue. Like it's not a virtue. It's a, one of those dirty good karmas. So yeah, you're going to get something good, but it's going to go or it's going to be at the wrong time or something like that, right? So um, if you have the strength to stay in a difficult situation, stay. But if you can't resist samsaric temptations, then you must get out because you have to protect your spiritual real estate whatever strength you've managed to get you have to protect it so that you can get stronger okay mm. the thing about vows there was a question in this class about whether um, you had to take vows in order for the virtue to be stronger and the answer to that is that if you take vows for the right reason and you hold them and you keep them. Yes, it will um, have quicker results for you, both directions, good and bad, right? But um, Geshele says just because you change your clothes, just because you change out of a t-shirt and a skirt and put on robes that are saffron and gold, does not do anything to your mind, right? If you don't have the right motivation. But if you do it because you're at least attempting to, then, you know, it's like the fake it till you make it thing, right? Like it's it's still a good effort. So, um, but the thing is, and I said this at the beginning of class, the really basic foundation of these vows is you have to have renunciation. You have to be fed up with the suffering in your own life and in the lives of others. And the thing about samsara, which is what this realm is that we're in, this suffering cycle of cyclical suffering, 
It's <laughs> one way to say it. Um, is that, you know, all the teachers say samsara is actually very kind because it will, it will inevitably reveal its true nature to you. No matter how okay life may be at any given point, it will kick you in the you know what, you know, and it will assert its true nature that it is suffering. So we're really poised to understand what renunciation is, to understand that motivation. And you know, as Lama Marut says, don't let any good tragedy or trauma or distress in your life go to waste. Like use it to fuel your practice and to grow and to build your muscles of compassion and love for others, right? Yeah. You know, Geshe actually distills it all down now to, I mean, I'm giving you lists of aid and this, that, and whatever, and we have, you know, all these different vows that you could potentially take, but Geshe does distill it all down to how kind have I been to others? How kind of, how kind have I been to myself and how kind have I been to others? Like in this moment, in this day, like how, how kind? And then just always remember that. That's how you have a good yoga class, actually. And if you don't happen to have a good yoga class in the moment, just know that it's all karma ripening and um, let it ripen, let it go, right? And then just plant the seeds for a better one next time by doing something good. Like maybe somebody next to you isn't having a good class either. And maybe you could share your water bottle with them or something. You know, it's just, there's always ways we can show kindness to people. Always. Okay. Let me see if I missed anything. Mm. There's something in this book. There's a colophon that says Jason Kappa wrote the book and Nulchu Dharma Bhadra explains Jason Kappa's name. Do you guys remember? We've taught this before. He's, um, J means Lord. Uh, Tsong Kappa is just the, Tsong is the name of the river that goes to the province of the land that he was born in. And I think it's also onion fields. Like sometimes he's known as the, the llama from the onion fields. But in this case, it's just uh, explaining that his name, Jason Kappa is the head of the lineage of the Dalai Lamas. So it's, it's just kind of cool to know where his name came from. So that's just a little aside in your book. And there's another, um, oh, this is what I opened the class with, right? Jason Kappa was explaining um, the whole importance of Vinaya by giving you an ex a, a, a deconstruction of the title of the commentary that he's teaching us from. The commentary is called The Essence of the Ocean of Discipline. That was in your, read your um, list from class one or two. So. Mm. It was the question about, you know, why is Vinaya called Vinaya? Why is Dulwa called Dulwa? It's because it, it disciplines you, right? Like it disciplines. So the essence of the ocean of discipline, the discipline is that you are dis disciplining your mind by destroying your mental afflictions, right? Any thought that disturbs the peace of your mind and taming your sense powers. Because really, it's our sense powers that get us into trouble. We see something we want, we taste something we want, we smell something we want, we feel something we want, right? And uh, it gets us into all kinds of trouble. So it's not that you shouldn't taste, see, smell, touch, but to be able to do it with wisdom, right? So this discipline helps you rein those in. I mean, when you do get into a really contemplative state, you actually aren't smelling or seeing much, right? It's um, although you could debate me on that. Um, so that's the discipline part, that you're taming your sense powers and your mental afflictions. Uh, the reason that it's called ocean is because the Vinaya is as vast as the ocean. Like the ocean is just this expansive, deep body of water, right? And so too is the Vinaya. It's very expansive. It's very deep. There's over 60,000 pages in the primary canon, and that's not even counting the commentaries. And then um, essence, right? Essence of the ocean of discipline. Well, in Tibet, they believe the ocean to be the source of precious jewels. And the most essential of these is the wishing jewel. 
It's kind of like Aladdin's lamp. If you ever got your hands on a wishing jewel, you could have whatever you wished for, is what they say. And they say that um, your prati moksha vows, your individual freedom vows, are more precious than a wishing jewel. So the essence of the ocean of discipline basically boils down to your vows. So that's why we're spending so much time on them. So you need to um, learn them, take them, and keep them. Okay. And again, just the fact that following these ideas, don't think that they're restrictive. They actually do give you a lot of freedom because they take the doubt out of stuff. Should I lie or shouldn't I? You know, no, you shouldn't. <laughs> and, you know, the question is taken out of the equation. And actually, the lying one's a difficult one. What about a white lie? What if I hurt somebody's feelings? Like, you know, there's all sorts of what they call spiritual conundrums, right? And if you really understand these vows, no more conundrums, or at least you know what to do in the face of one. So that's all. Okay, it's five to nine, it's cookie time. And we're done, that's course, that's the class, unless anyone has any questions.